Tonight we're going to do a Bible study and we're going to talk about the subject of the family. The family. And tonight I'm going to try something a little different. I'm going to try not to let my zeal or passion get me screaming and hollering and, and talking a hundred miles a minute. And See, when I get serious about something, and many times I'm looking at about 25 pages worth of notes, and I know i got a long way to go in a short time to get there. Many times I start talking really, 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 really fast. And so tonight, we don't have a whole lot of notes up here, but I hope that what we do when we look at the Scripture is that we can just slow down a minute and look at God's plan for the husband, the wife, and the children. Now, as I mentioned, Pastor had planned to, to preach tonight, and he called me late yesterday, and he changed plans because Sister Foster passed away and they're there with them at this time. And so it gave me an opportunity to teach on the family, which I feel is just a perfect extension of our study we had recently on holiness principles for daily living. And so I'm going to use a lot of Scripture tonight, but I'm going to try to slow down and let the Bible speak for itself. I'm not going to try to add a whole lot of commentary to it, and I'm going to use the New King James Version just for clarity, just to make it sound a little more clear in our modern language. So the Bible on family, the marriage relationship, the children relationship, what does it say? Why do we as Christians practice family the way that we practice family? Where does the idea of marriage come from? Where does the idea of a loving relationship in marriage and children? What is God's purpose for children in the life of mother and father. And you're going to find out that when we talk about these things, that you're going to see that there are a lot of modern notions in our land that are not bad principles that we have lived by for so long, but ultimately some of them are in opposition to even what the Bible teaches. And so tonight as we look at principles for the family, I'd just like to share with you that I feel that we need to slow down many times and just talk about questions and answers and get back to the root of who we are and why we do what we do. Yes. Last week, I had the privilege on Wednesday night of sitting in our youth department and answering questions like we're doing here now. And you know, many of them are so hungry being young and they see society and I'm challenging them like I challenge you. Question do, why do we do what we do? And to a younger generation, that speaks to them. Because they're taught from very young, don't question, you know, to question everything. Don't have respect for authority just because they're authority. Question everything. Why do we do what we do? And so when I say those things to them, it really speaks a language that they understand. Finally, there's someone in authority that's telling me to question why we do what we do. And you know, historically, in the church especially, people have been taught, don't question, just do what you're told. And, you know, that worked for many, many years. And really, at the root of it, that is the way it should be. But since we are in a new time and a new generation and people that speak pretty plainly and pretty boldly, I think it's time for the church to start being the one filling in these blanks, answering these questions, and having these hard discussions. Because the world is filling in the blanks. The world's giving them answers. The world's giving them solutions. The world doesn't mind talking about sex in a pretty real way. The world doesn't mind talking about immoral behavior and saying that it's okay. And then many times they come into a church and it's never talked about. It's taboo or it's unspoken things. You just don't say certain things around civilized folk. And a lot of this has to do with a different generation. There's nothing wrong either way, but the point is that we're living in a generation where young people are leaving the church in record numbers. And they're doing it after they reach the age of maturity, 18, 19, 20 years old. They're walking out the door and they're never returning. And the reason why many of them are doing that, according to their own words, is because they were never told why they believed what they believed. Their questions were never answered. If they asked questions about holiness or standards or whatever, they were just told, well, the Bible says so, just do it and be quiet about it. And that didn't work for them. And so they've decided that, well, they're not going to do it anymore. They're going to go somewhere else. And the world has given them all kind of fun opportunities to try to exercise what the world has told them would be best for their lives. Many times the church gets reintroduced to them 20 years later when their lives are a mess, their marriage is broken, they're on the third or fourth divorce, and they're addicted to something, and we're having to pick up and patch up and try to do what should have been done originally, and that was answer questions and say, this is why we do what we do, this is why we believe what we believe, and if you'll live this way, then you will have a good life. 
And so I think that the church needs more teaching now than ever. And the church doesn't need to be afraid to talk about subjects that historically have not been really the subjects that would be covered in this kind of atmosphere. We live in a world that's driven by money and lust. And ultimately for many years we haven't had good teaching on money and lust. And so we wonder why people come into the church and leave the church and then ultimately they go out and follow the world's prescription for all these things. And we scratch, we scratch our head and we say, why is it that they're not doing what they ought to do being a part of the church when we never really effectively taught them how they should live or how they should behave? Many times when we talk about making disciples, we're talking about winning new folks. We're talking about growing, bringing people in to get to know the Lord, evangelizing the lost. 75% of preaching in Pentecostal churches is all evangelistic. It's get people to the altar and get them filled with the Holy Ghost, which is good. But the problem is it's not balanced with teaching. If you don't teach those same people that were filled with the Holy Ghost, that had an emotional, supernatural experience with God, how to live, what the Bible says, how to study the Bible, then they will find themselves at some point in the very near future expecting the clouds to open up, God to reach down into their soul, then to feel that emotional experience that they felt all over again. And when they go a day or a week or so without feeling God in that very real and personal way, then the enemy's going to say, see, you didn't have anything. God's rejected you. You haven't had another experience with Him. You might as well leave. And so if we don't run right alongside them and make disciples, teach them, show them how they ought to walk, how they ought to talk, and how they ought to live for the Lord, then ultimately they're going to leave. And so that is what I think my burden is tonight, is that we ought to be able to look at the Scripture, which is the textbook of our lives. It is the model that God has given us so that we could make decisions about how we should handle sensitive subjects and topics, how we should approach a moral world, how we should look at the world and make decisions based around God's Word, not based around our opinion, not based around how we have been taught traditionally, not based around any other structure other than God's Word. Can we adequately answer the questions that the next generation is going to be asking us? And I always love spending time with our youth because they're not ashamed or afraid to ask questions when they're given the platform. One time here some time back, I told them, I said, I want you to take a little slip of paper I don't want you to write your name on it, but I want you to write a question that you've always wanted answered, but you've never had answered in the church. And you write it down, and we'll put them all in a hat, and we'll shuffle it around, and then I'll pull questions out, and I will see if I can answer these questions. And if I can't, then I'll try to get some help, and we'll get you the answers that you need. I had questions about dinosaurs. I had questions about homosexuality. I had questions about creation and evolution. I had all kinds of very interesting questions from our young people that are too afraid to raise their hand and speak up for fear of what they may end up causing to happen as a result of the conversation. But in that kind of atmosphere, they had more freedom because their name wasn't attached to what they were asking. And so I was able to have conversations about things such as family and marriage, traditional marriage based on the Scripture, things of that nature, that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do otherwise. And so my goal in here this evening is that you as mothers and fathers will be able to do some of these things yourself and hopefully be better equipped to answer questions about traditional families and marriage. The Bible says that God ordained the family. We see that God created a helper for Eve. We'll read the Scripture here in just a moment. But He created a helper for Adam in Eve. And then through that, He ordained the first marriage. And then we see from that, children are born and brought into the marriage. And so any time in America when we talk about marriage, since it is a Christian union ordained by God, then we ought to look at marriage being just that. I don't understand why a civilization, a world out there today, that claims they don't believe in God, that claims they don't have morals and values, that they can do whatever they want. They use terms such as my truth versus the truth and things of that nature. What they're doing is trying to say there's no absolute truth. If you feel one way and I feel differently, then we're both okay. It's all right. But ultimately, no, you all have a standard. What is that standard? And so let's investigate the world and see what their standard is. Because I've never been told by any person that claims they don't believe in God that murder is okay. And so I ask, well, why do you believe murder is not okay if you don't believe in God? Because that's where that principle comes from. And so ultimately, everyone has a value structure based around something. We've just got to dig down and historically look at why they proclaim what they proclaim. 
And so ultimately, why do you, Mr. Atheist, Mrs. Atheist, whatever the case, want to get married? It's a Christian union. It's ordained by God. You don't believe in God. Just live together. Do whatever you want. Why is marriage so important? Many times it's tradition. Well, everybody just gets married in this country. Many other times it's, well, we're trying to destroy the institution of marriage. We want to get married because you Christians tell us we can't. And so we want to use your language, your terms, and we want to do it in your churches. And if you deny us the opportunity, we're going to sue you and we're going to try to shut you down. There really is a radical element to the homosexual movement that's doing those things in our country today. And so ultimately the hope tonight is as we get through this that you will understand what the Bible says about husbands and wives and then ultimately children. And so I'd like to begin with Mark 10 and 6. From the beginning God made them male and female. And now I asked Brother Joseph, he don't have to post these because I'm using New King James Version and we use King James on the prompter. And so ultimately it's Mark 10 and 6 and it's, very, very, it's a word for word translation. It's a very dependable translation. And I think it will make these things much more clear to us. From the beginning God made the male and female, Jesus speaking. And so He's referring to Genesis 1, 27 and 28. It says, So God created man in His own image. In the image of God He created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. And then we see in Genesis where it says, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So we see the history of the first man and the first woman. Now back to Jesus in Mark 10, verse 7, He says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother. And Luke 20 and 34 says, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes in chapter 7 and 2, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. If they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And that's in 1 Corinthians 7. He's saying that, and if you'll read that whole chapter in context, the Apostle Paul saying it's okay to be single. It's okay to choose marriage. He's saying that a person that's single will care for the affairs of God. But a person that is married will care for the affairs of God, but also have to be mindful of their spouse. And so ultimately he says, if you can't keep yourself sexually pure, then you have to marry. That's the command. But ultimately it is, if you want to remain single, fine. If you want to marry, fine. There's beautiful parts of both. But ultimately, you've got to do it within the context of a sexual relationship, one man and one woman. Galatians 6 and 5 said, well, excuse me, 1 Timothy 5 and 8, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. The King James says an infidel. It's referring to men that don't provide for their family. And many times you hear this mentioned, pastor and others will preach and teach that a man ought to provide for his home. I look at the Bible and I see that it's man's responsibility to provide a living for his wife and for his children, to care for them, to protect them, to provide them security. And we'll see in the Scripture that God has a very clear role for a man and God has a very clear role for a woman. When we get into some of the women issues here shortly, you'll see that they're very unpopular in our current context, in our world today. And many women today are forced to work because we live in a society that for 50, 60, 70 years has been built around two income families. And so now there are innocent victims as a result of the feminist movement that fought so hard for all of these equal rights in the workplace and things of that nature. And now ultimately you'll find out that rebellious movement always start with good principles. They start out with something that we need equal rights, civil rights, female rights, whatever it is, we need equal rights, which is true. We need the right to vote, which is true. These are good. These are honorable things. They should have been taking place all along. People were being wrong. They were against the Scripture when they were practicing things otherwise. Women should not have been treated as property. Neither should African Americans. Ultimately, if they followed the Bible and the principles contained therein, they would have seen that all along. And so you have a leader that rises up and that says we need equal treatment in various areas. And they're right. They always start with good principles 
And they're going in the right direction. But what you'll find out is you go a few years and then it will be hijacked by some radical that will take it even further. That now it's no longer we want to be equal with men. We don't need a man. And then before you know it, there's a spirit behind that. And the spirit is that it's rebellion. And what I always challenge people to do is this. When you look at the history or why we teach what we teach, when you look at the hair issue or men not grooming themselves or people not dressing appropriately, you, you think back to 1950s, 1940s, Blondie and Dagwood, they slept in twin beds, pushed the beds together when they desired to be with one another as husband and wife. They wouldn't go to the mailbox without wearing a three-piece suit. That was literally our culture in that day and in that time. And we've seen a breakdown in our dress, a breakdown in our behavior, a breakdown in how we carry ourselves in public, and it's all ultimately a spirit, a spirit of rebellion. I firmly believe this with all that I am. And now ultimately you will see that it's hijacked. And we see that rebellion takes root. And so it's no longer that it's about some noble cause or some noble purpose that we're rallying. Now it's going farther than that. It's no longer we want to be equal with men, we want to be better than men. It's no longer that we want to be appreciated, it's now we don't need a man to begin with. We'll have children, two wives, no husbands, things of that nature. You're just seeing the product of this rebellious nature, this rebellious atmosphere of the 60s and 70s and later years. Is that ultimately you're seeing the consequences of people that desire to do life the way they define life, and oppose doing life the way God defined they ought to do it. And so ultimately realize that these things are good things that start and then rebellion takes over. Now we know that Satan was cast from God's presence because of rebellion. And so anytime I see rebellion, I immediately it throws up a red flag because God's not in rebellion. When I hear about churches split, some man gets a wild idea that he's supposed to be the pastor and that old pastor needs to just step aside and let him do what God's called him to do. I hear those kinds of things. You'd be surprised by people that are supposed to be better than this, that are supposed to be more honorable, that are supposed to look at the Word of God as their guidebook. And I will tell you, my own personal policy, and you may disagree with me, is if a church started as a result of a split, someone rebelled against an established church and took half the people with them, I won't preach in that church. And I'm going to tell you why that is. Because anything that's formed and founded in rebellion is not of God. Amen. It may go 100 years. It may go 150 years. But at the end of it all, I'm not going to endorse that kind of behavior. Amen. Because rebellion is the product of Satan. It's not the product of God. And it's time that the church realized that we should be able to understand the difference. Taking good principles and corrupting them. Anybody that knows anything about Satan, you'll know that he takes things that God loves. Marriage, the sexual relationship, the church, the family. And he'll make some counterfeit that looks a whole lot like what it ought to be. But then ultimately some small thing will be changed. And then ultimately before you know it, you're completely in false doctrine or you're completely living in sin when you felt that it was all something that you were doing that had a wholesome principle. If there ever was a time that people ought to know God's Word, it ought to be today. Because there are churches on every corner and they all claim to use the same book. They all claim to have the right interpretation. They all claim to be the one that's going to make it to heaven. But ultimately, how do we know if we don't open our Word and study it for ourselves which one is true and which one is false? And the Bible says each man will stand before God and you'll have to answer for your own actions. Not because some preacher taught you wrong. Not because someone in your family taught you wrong. But ultimately you are going to have to stand before the Lord. And the Lord allowed us to be born in the greatest, most blessed nation in the land where we have most of us ten or more copies of the Bible. And so shame on us if we stand before the Lord and we've never read through the Scripture, studied it for ourselves, and allowed it to speak to us and allowed God to speak to us. And so ultimately we've got to get back to being a biblically literate people. And if we don't do that, then we're going to have more and more difficulty. Right. Now, some of the Scripture verses I have up here are Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. I'm not going to read some of those, but ultimately if you read that in context and you understand what you're reading, you would be surprised that some of those things are in your Bible. 
because it is very romantic. It's about the man chasing and courting the woman. It's talking about romance is what it's referring to. And so ultimately, I'll just leave it at this. It's saying that your relationship, you ought to work to allow romance into your relationship. You ought to work hard so that your spouse be pleased with you and that you can continue to keep that fire burning and continue to keep that love going. You ought to pursue your mate and your mate ought to pursue you. You ought to see your mate as God's gift to you and ultimately love your mate for the rest of your life and be committed to that person. That's the scriptural principle for marriage. I've shared it many times, but I'll share it again. It's the greatest example to a lost world of Jesus Christ and His church. It's people that are willing to forgive one another. People that are willing to stick together through thick and thin when it gets tough, when it gets rough. People that are not willing to leave because they made a commitment so many years ago. And many times it's the other one's fault or it's my fault or I've made a bad choice. And ultimately there are terrible choices that people make in our culture. There are hateful things that happen because the world says it's okay. You're having a child. Your marriage is on the rocks. You want to get rid of the child? Just go get rid of the child. You can do it today. The world promotes that behavior. And many times people go and they do it because they're hurting. They don't know what else to do. They don't know where to turn. They don't want to bring another child into a failed relationship. And so ultimately they go and they trust and they listen to this quote unquote authority, this doctor that tells them, oh, no problem, no pain, no situation. And then ultimately spiritually they're scarred for the rest of their lives because they understood exactly what happened when that procedure was over. And so it's time that we as the church stop pointing the finger of condemnation and start reaching out our arms and wrapping them around God's people and loving on them and showing them the true nature and compassion of God. Because someone that is living that life, they know they're wrong. It's not our responsibility to go beat them up and tell them how wrong they are. We can get them in these altars full of the Holy Ghost, love on them, and let the Holy Spirit do His work. We should never leave a church service feeling discouraged or demoralized like we're not living up to the standard that God gave us. The preaching and teaching ought to be encouraging and uplifting. It ought to say that you are made in the image of God, that God loves you, that God's given you a purpose, that God has a plan for your life. You've been beat up by the world Monday, Tuesday, now Wednesday night. We'll come in this place and be filled and be satisfied that God loved you and gave Himself for you. And then leave this place Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and show that love Spread that love to a world that's lost and hurting and in need. Because the world needs to know that they're loved. They need to feel something from you. They need to see something different. They're miserable. They're going to be miserable to you. And they're going to treat you so that you'll respond miserably. But we as Christians have got to take the high road. We've got to be the ones that will not respond in kind when they are hateful to us. But that will love them. Those are the principles that Jesus taught when He talks about loving your enemy and praying for those that despitefully use you. Because Jesus knows that if you're going to make a difference in a life, if you're going to change the world, you're going to do it by showing them the better nature of the human experience and showing them the love of Jesus Christ. That is what has changed the world and continues to change the world to this day. It's not hate. It's not violence. It's love. Love will provoke men and women to do the right thing. I personally praise the Lord. Thank your hands to the Lord. Thank you. When I see violent criminals on the news or read about it in the paper, what I think is not how that person deserves justice because of some evil that they do. Now, I'll eventually get there because I'm just as human as anyone else. But what we ought to do is this, is look at that person, that person with that mugshot that looks so mean and so ugly and say that's someone's little boy or that's someone's little girl. At one time in their life they looked in those innocent little eyes and they had hope for a bright future for this child. And then ultimately this child because of socialization, the environment that they've been raised in, they've been conditioned to believe they're a failure. That they can never do anything right. I've been treated like a criminal for 20 years. I might as well as live up to my namesake. I've been treated poorly so I'll go out and do what to the world what the world has done to me. They're just flesh, just like we're just flesh. They don't have the Spirit of God. They don't act on behalf of the Spirit. They don't know what life in the Spirit is. When you hurt them, they hurt you. That's what the flesh does. 
When you come against them, they come against you. If you steal from them, they steal from you. If you have more than they do, then they will take more from you because you held them in bondage for so long. And many times that is an excuse that they will use. They have been told that they are owed. They have been told that they are the victim. They have been told that they should and that they deserve better. That hard work is not for them. That those that have a lot should be willing to give half of what they earn so that these others that don't have much can have just as much as they do. That's the gospel, the social gospel that many so-called preachers will be preaching tonight is how the man owes you something. And if they were true Christians, then they would give you half of what they have. The Bible never says that. The Bible says you work hard for what you have and you give honor and glory to God. And you thank God at the end of your week for the job that you had and the opportunity you had to do it. That's the Bible. It's not you got to make $20, $30, $40, $50 an hour. It's not you got to be the vice president. you got to be the big person, the big shot in the community. The Bible is give an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Be a man of God and a woman of God. And let the world be transformed by the power of your actions. That's God's plan for your life. That's the reason why you can hear testimonies. Brother Creasy shared some of people on a job site, just a construction worker, a lowly class according to our modern society, singing about Jesus. The janitor pushing the mop broom in the school, singing about the love of Jesus Christ because they figured out something that the world hasn't quite figured out. It's not about status. It's not about position. The only status and position that matters is being saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Where will I stand on that judgment day? Will I stand before Him and be told, well done? Or will I stand before Him and be told that I was a worker of iniquity? That is what really matters. It's not about position, about materialistic things. It's about what we do with the life that God has given us. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter 4 through 8 says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. And that's the Apostle Paul writing the true nature of love. The world has a counterfeit love that's been promoted by Satan. And it all involves physical things and pleasure. And ultimately the Bible says that your love is your word, is your commitment, is your making a bond like Christ made a bond with the church. We chose Christ, Christ chose us. You choose your spouse, your spouse chose you. Your marriage relationship is the closest example of not preaching the gospel with words, but living the gospel and expressing the the gospel through the life that you live because these folks that are looking for Jesus Christ are going to see you and know that you've got the same problems that they have but you deal with the, your problems in a different way than they deal with their problems and then ultimately you might be the one that leads someone to come and give their heart to Jesus Christ a soul might be saved because you were willing to be committed in that marriage when the world says you should have left a long time ago Jesus talks about later that there are certain qualifiers for a man to have a divorce. And I'm not going to get into those things. There are hurtful situations. There are problems God can forgive. There are situations where I would advise a wife or a husband to get a divorce. Violence and things of that nature, ultimately, these things are complicated and I'm not making them simple. But ultimately, I want you to understand that the Bible does address these things. And when Jesus talks about Moses writing a bill of divorcement as they asked him the question, then ultimately he starts out with this, this phrase. He says, because of the hardness of your hearts. And that's all I want to say, because of the hardness of of your hearts. Jesus in that one phrase said this, if you truly had faith in God, you would not ask me these questions. If you truly have faith that God can raise a dead man, can He heal your marriage? If you truly have faith that God can perform great supernatural miracles, can God not save your home and your family? And so ultimately, a man or a woman that's on their knees in prayer can ultimately do great things in the name of Jesus Christ. And so ultimately to answer the question is these things happen and I'm not here to beat anyone up by any means. But ultimately to let each and every one of you know that God's will for your life is that your marriage be a success. Is that your children be successful. Is that ultimately the finger pointing stop and that forgiveness come and take root in your life.
T.F. Tenney was asked one time, what's the secret to your 50 years of marriage? What one word would you use to summarize that they were expecting love or some flowery word? He said, forgiveness. Forgiveness. Jesus Christ Himself said that if you can't forgive, then, then God will not forgive you. And so we come and we offer forgiveness. We ask God forgive us of sinful things that we've done in our own life. Jesus Himself, when He talks about judging in Matthew 7, people take that Scripture out of context so many times, and I won't go there tonight, but ultimately this is the principle Jesus is saying. He's not saying don't judge other people. What He's saying is get yourself right, get your heart right, reflect on how you're living your life, take that beam out of your eye, He says, before you go and start remarking on that speck that's in your brother's eye. He even goes as far as to say that if you're at the altar offering a sacrifice, before you make that sacrifice to God, leave that altar and go get right with your brother. Go forgive your neighbor. If you don't love your brother, your neighbor who you can see, then how can you truly say that you love God who you cannot see? And so ultimately, he says, before you even make your sacrifice, go and get your heart right with your brother. And so the point is not to judge. The point is to judge with the heart of Jesus Christ. To look at people and to judge them by their fruit in a spirit of love and a spirit of compassion. The Bible tells us, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Ten Commandments, Exodus 20 and 14. 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 through 7. Each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. For God did not call us into uncleanness, but in holiness. And so ultimately he's saying, Keep yourself one to another, husband to wife. Mark 10 and 8, continuing in the words of Jesus, The two shall become one flesh. So when they are no longer two, but one flesh. Genesis 2 and 25 says they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And so ultimately Proverbs 5, 18 through 20 says, Let the fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth as a loving deer and a graceful doe. Let her breasts satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? Those things are in the Scripture, principles for living that we might go out and live a good life so that we might honor our spouse and honor our children. Hebrews 13 and 4 says, Marriage is honorable among all the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. The marriage bed is the appropriate relationship for a sexual, a sexual union. 1 Corinthians 7, Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. He's saying that your body belongs to your spouse. Your spouse's body belongs to you. You should be kind to one another and considerate and understand that there is a real enemy called the devil and that Satan would love to destroy your marriage and destroy your home. And if you start using certain things such as cutting someone off from a marriage relationship in a sexual way, then Satan will very quickly find a way to allow that problem to become a big problem and a perceived need will not be met. And then before you know it, you're on the job talking to somebody that knows what you do for a living and that tells you how good you look and how well you do at work. And before you know it, you end up in bed together and you never intended for it to be a sexual relationship, but you had a perceived need need and you meet someone of the opposite sex that had a perceived need and Satan allows the two of you to start having intimate conversations that you know you shouldn't have but before you know it you're having these conversations and then before you know it the enemy's telling you this is the perfect person for you too bad you're married too bad she's married or vice versa and before you know it you've convinced yourself in some way I've even heard people say that God put us together which is foolishness because it's against the Word of God. But there are people that will become so convinced that my needs should be met and if my partner really loved me, my partner would meet these needs. Therefore, I'm going to act out and blame them. The Bible, yes, even addresses that. You ought to be the best friend, the lover, the romantic person for your spouse. 
Proverbs 26 and 7 says, Who can find a faithful man? The righteous man walks in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. 1 Timothy 5 and 14 says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So, yes, the Bible does say, marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary. Those things are in the Scripture addressed to women. Now you talk about this or you teach about this in most modern churches, they'll say, well, oh, you chauvinist man, you just want a woman barefoot and pregnant behind a stove rattling some pots and pans. Those are the kinds of things you'll hear. But ultimately, that's not the true nature of a loving husband that loves and gives himself to his wife. It's not that this is something you're required to do. It's something that eventually in your relationship with God and with your husband, you would enjoy doing. Now many times, as I said, we live in a culture where you have to have two incomes. And so really the great tragedy of our day is women that are Christian women that want to live and to raise children at home and then they have to face all the scorn from the world that says you don't have a position, you don't have a career, you don't have this education and they try to treat them like men and tell them that you ought to have all these things and so these women that are trying to do the right, right thing are having to deal with all this societal pressure to build some name for themselves and then on top of that many of them don't have the privilege because they can't afford to stay home. And so ultimately, these are societal consequences as a result of a quote-unquote Christian people that stopped following God's Word some years ago. And now we as the church have to do our very best to live according to God's Word, build strong families, love our children, love our spouses, and then ultimately love our neighbors as well. It's a commitment, and it, it takes a lot of time. Admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the Word of God may not be blasphemed. That's Titus 2, 4 through 5. Ephesians says, Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and He is Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands. And then, 1 Peter says, Be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the pers hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Now this is the way this works. Husbands love and adore and have a relationship with God Almighty. And when they love and live for the Lord, that wife naturally enjoys and submits to that husband. I've told you my own testimony. For many years I was told by the adversary, Crystal ought to worship the ground I walk on. I married her. She'd been divorced. She had two daughters. I was a young man, good education, made a good salary, everything going for me. I fell in love with her. We got married. And before long, problems happened, as they always do. And I'm telling myself, you know what? She ought not treat me this way. I didn't think about how I treated her or what we had done in that regard. I just thought about how she really ought to think a lot more of me because of what I was willing to do. And those are the kinds of things that that enemy will have you doing. He'll have you second-guessing the questions and the commitments and the decisions you've made because someone else is treating you poorly when ultimately you are responsible for you and your decisions alone. And you know, I was amazed when I got filled with the Holy Ghost and I went and started putting Jesus Christ number one in my life and making Him the head of my life, how naturally Crystal just became the perfect wife that I'd always wanted. And we had problems and situations, and Lord, we still do. But ultimately, the difference was the Holy Spirit showed me that if I get myself where I need to be, I don't have to worry about my wife or my children getting where they need to be. So let's stop focusing on them, their needs, what they should or should not be doing. Let's get Mark right, and when we get Mark right, then you will be amazed at the miracle God will perform in your family. And that's exactly what God did. And so ultimately you have to understand that you too, if I allowed you to share your testimony, you could tell me the same thing about what God did in your life. 
and did in your marriage and how God is still working in your marriage and in your home and how He's doing great and wonderful things. And so ultimately understand that that is our desire. Men, let your head be Christ. Men have the greater challenge, the greater burden even, because the Bible says give yourself for your wife as Christ gave Himself for the church. That's the Bible way of saying, be willing to die for your spouse. Be willing to die for your wife. That's what the Bible's saying. And I heard a preacher one time say it pretty plainly. He said, Husband, if you would convince your wife that you would die for her, she would be a different woman tomorrow. And there's a lot of truth to that. And so ultimately understand that when you're called to walk in the nature and mimic the character of Christ, that's a high calling. But ultimately the Bible says it's possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.33, let the wife see that she respects her husband. And then ultimately Ephesians says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So it's husbands and wives, wives submitting to husbands. But Ephesians says, submitting to one another. God has a plan for you and God has a plan for your spouse. And ultimately we must do our very best to do what God has asked us to do. Genesis 2 and 18, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. He who finds a good wife, Proverbs 18, 22, finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord, Proverbs 19 and 14. Proverbs 31, Who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband Safely trust her so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. A virtuous woman. Proverbs 30, 18 and 19. Three, there are three things which are too wonderful for me. Yes, four, which I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the air. The way of a serpent on a rock. The way of a ship in the midst of the sea. And the last one, the way of a man with a virgin. A man courting. A man being romantic with someone that he hopes to marry. Ephesians 5 again. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. As their own bodies, they ought to love their wives. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it, cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself. Men, love your wives as you love yourself. Ecclesiastes 9 and 9, Live joyfully with the wife whom you love. In Exodus 20 and 17, You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Love the wife of your youth. Her husband praises her, Proverbs 31, 28. And 1 Peter 3 and 7, Dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands and wives. And now as we close tonight, I'm going to go very briefly through children. Psalms 127 and 3 says that children are a heritage from the Lord. That is your gift from God. And ultimately the Bible says that you have the privilege of raising God's children. Raising them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord so that when they grow, they will mimic that and imitate your behavior and raise strong Christian families. But the Bible places precedent on the marriage relationship. Because the marriage relationship, you chose one another just like Christ chose the church. Your children were a gift given by God. And so you didn't choose your children. Your children came and you have an uh, obligation to them. But when they're raised and gone and living for the Lord, God help us, then you and your spouse are still there, still committed, and still living for God. Many times I hear people that go through a divorce later in life, they've convinced themselves that, you know, my children are young, I'm in a bad marriage, whatever the reason, I'm going to stick with this person until they're old enough to get out of the house, and when my children are gone, I'm out of here. And it's usually based around some reason such as I don't want another man raising my child or things of that nature. What I have found and what studies show is that the older the children are, the more hurtful it is to them. Because you represented something to them their whole childhood that now they're convinced was a lie. You were putting on a show. You were playing a part in their presence. And now they're going out and they're duplicating those same mistakes and making 
those mistakes. And so ultimately understand that children were designed for a mother and a father. That was God's plan for their life. Psalms 127, the fruit of the womb is his reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. Happy is the man with a home filled with children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Obey, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, Ephesians 6. Colossians 3 and 20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Colossians 3 and 20. In Proverbs 31 28, her children rise up and call her blessed because of the way she lived in their lives. I'll end with this scripture, Matthew 19 and 3. It says, it is, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any just reason? In Mark 10 and 9, therefore what God has joined together, let no man separate. What God has joined together, let no man separate. I read a little article I'd like to share with you in closing, and it said this, Children surveyed what children remember, and here's what children remember. Father and mother were kind to one another. Home was a happy place governed by the law of love. Each child was treated fairly, yet required to obey and honor their mother and father. Sunday was a day of worship in our home, and the Bible, God's law, was how we settled everything. Home was a place where friendships were dear, but truth was dearer. Although mother and father worked hard, they took time to read the Bible daily and to pray with me as a child. And so ultimately, those are the obligations. But don't look at them as obligations. Look at them as opportunities to raise up a new generation that can go out and teach the Gospel of Jesus Christ. If you would, please stand. I'd like to pray with you. Thank you so very much tonight. I pray that this has been helpful. Dearest Lord, I thank You for the opportunity tonight to share what I feel You've placed on my heart. To take just a moment and teach about husbands and wives and relationship in marriage and relationship children to father and mother. God, that is our most important relationship. And I pray that we will start allowing that to be our most important relationship that our time will be spent with our families and not chasing dreams and ideas that have their birth in the world and the world system. Might we be good fathers, be good mothers, and be good children. God, guide us with Your Spirit and help us to understand Your Word. We desire to be pleasing to You. Let's make that recommitment tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I ask if you would gather around the front. Just spend a time in prayer to the Lord. Thank you so very much. God bless you. We love you.